Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's book launch event with Thierry Mio Jomians and Sunisa Manning, celebrating the launch of Thierry's book, Names for Light, A Family History. My name is Lily Philpott. I'm the programs manager at the Asian American Writers Workshop, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event space. A quick visual description of me. I have short black hair, I'm wearing glasses, um, and a blue and red printed dress. And there are a number of photos on the wall behind me. Please do say hi and let us know in the chat where you are watching from. I am speaking to you all from Brooklyn, New York, which is on ancestral and unceded Canarsie and Munsee Lenape land. For those of you who are new to the AAWW, we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian diasporic literature and storytelling. We hold frequent readings and conversations like this one. We organize community arts programming in New York City high schools and senior centers. We run fellowship programs for emerging writers of color, and we publish an award-winning online literary magazine called The Margins. You can visit aaww.org or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, where the recording of this event will be posted. I want to thank our friends at Books Are Magic, who are our virtual booksellers this fall. You can find a link to purchase Theory's book and Sunisa's books as well in the chat, and we hope you'll do so and support local independent bookstores as you do. During the event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from this event. We will have time for audience Q&A at the end of the hour. You can ask your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We are going to begin with readings from both of our authors, and I am going to briefly introduce Thierry and Sunisa, and then I hope you'll join me in welcoming them both. Thierry Mio Jomint is the author of The End of Peril, The End of Enmity, The End of Strife, A Haven, and Names for Light, A Family History, which won the Grey Wolf Press Nonfiction Prize. She has a BA from Brown University, an MFA from the University of Notre Dame, and a PhD from the University of Denver. She teaches at Amherst College. Sunisa Manning was born and raised in Bangkok by Thai and American parents. She has a BA in English Literature from Brown University and an MFA in Creative Writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts. Her first novel, A Good True Thai, was a finalist for the Epigram Books Fiction Prize for Southeast Asian Writers. It was published in Southeast Asia in September 2020 and went into a second printing in February 2021. Please do join me in welcoming a theory on screen to read from Names for Light, and thank you again for being here. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so fun. Thank you so much for that, Lily. Um, thank you to Sunisa for reading with me. Um, it's really fun to see all your names popping up in the participants uh, list, and I wish I could see your faces too, but you can see mine at least. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read from just the beginning of the book, so I apologize if anyone has already heard me read from this. Um, the book is divided into four sections, five sections, and each section has a place name as sort of a chapter title. So the first one is Le Mianna. My great grandfather died a man that was reborn as me. He died in a small village in the jungle, the son of a princess hiding from war. The village where they hid was called Le Mianna, Four Faces a village built around a pagoda of the same name, bearing a four-faced Buddha. It was my great-grandmother's village, the place where she was born. The city where I was born was also once a place to hide, Yangong, the end of Yan, of peril, and Mati strife. It was a place where there were no enemies, where enemies could not follow. Except enemies did follow, so that by the time I was born, the city had been conquered thrice, by the British, the Japanese, and the military junta, three enemies to symbolize the three torments of the mind, greed, aversion, illusion. 
My great grandfather's death was foretold by a trunk that slipped off a bridge and fell into the river upon the family's arrival in the village. My great grandfather's trunk full of his precious things. The son of a princess, my great grandfather had inherited diamonds and rubies, sapphires and pearls, jewels my mother had never seen, but had heard her mother talk about with remorse. But all the jewels were eventually sold one by one to educate my great grandfather's sons. Many years after my great grandfather's trunk fell in the river, my mother dreamed two trunks were thrown into the artificial lake in the center of the city where she had married my father on a floating mythical bird. My mother was inside of one trunk, my brother in the other, and both trunks were coffins sinking into the lake, filling up with cold water. And in the dream, my mother tried to scream to break out. She threw her body against the lid of the trunk, kicked and clawed, but it would not open, she could not breathe, until finally she ceased to struggle. She accepted death, and as she closed her eyes, the trunk opened, and her body floated to the surface, alone in that cold water. When my mother awoke from the dream, she knew my brother would not live. Except my brother did live since he returned as my eldest sister, who was born with a birthmark on her foot in the same spot where my grandfather had placed a thumbprint of ash on my brother's foot before he was cremated. There are no marks on my body from a previous life. Unlike my eldest sister, I was born perfectly blank, perfectly bare. For years, I waited for a mark to appear, a sign of who I was or had been or would become. I searched my body, read and reread it carefully, the sharp point of a tooth, the shape of my hands, the, place, the places where I could not bear to be touched, my back, my pelvis, under my chin. I was afraid to change my body in any way to leave my own mark upon it. I got no tattoos, no piercings. I never dyed my hair, and the one time I had it chemically straightened, I shaved it off afterward. I believed I had to keep my body plain and pristine if I was to receive the sign. More than once, I believed I had immaculately conceived a child. It is possible for a body to mimic the conditions of pregnancy if the mind believes, possible for the uterus to expand, for the cervix to soften, for the belly to swell. My belly did not swell, but for several months I felt nauseated and tender and did not bleed. Every time I found the blood on the sheets or on my underwear, it was both a relief and a loss. As a child, I conflated my great-grandfather's body and his trunk of possessions and imagined it was he who slipped off the bridge and fell into the river. I imagined the water turning pink where he hit his head on a rock, the water carrying him away downstream, then around a bend, so my great-grandfather and grandmother could no longer see him. All rivers lead to waterfalls or to the ocean, so I imagined my great-grandfather was transported somewhere no one could follow him. Although my grandmother did try, since she moved south to Yangon, then called Rangoon, the city by the ocean, and my parents and I tried to follow him further since we moved across the Pacific. As a child, I imagined that one day my great grandfather's body would wash up on a beach in Half Moon Bay, the way dead whales, jellyfish, and cows sometimes did. Even when I learned that my great grandfather had died of a hemorrhagic stroke, a blood vessel that ruptured in his brain. Even when I learned he had died sitting in a chair, not drowning in a river. And that for my great grandfather, dying in the jungle, dying in wartime, meant dying in the comfortable ancestral home of his wife, the daughter of the village elder. I could not erase the path that the river had carved in my mind from under the bridge in Le Nyatha, south to join the Patain River, then through the Delta into the Pacific Ocean and across it to the shores of Northern California, a path created by my great grandfather's body, or rather the absence of his body, an absence that I had to fill with my body since I was reborn from him. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siri, for that beautiful reading. Um, I am going to bring Sunisa back up on screen. Um, and we will hear from a good true Thai as well. Hi, everyone. 
Thank you for having me. Thank you, Asian American Writers Workshop. Thank you, Pro Bono, ASL, and Selena for interpreting for me. And thank you, Theory, for having me uh, speak with you to launch your book. It's so beautiful, and I'm really excited to celebrate it. Um, I'm joining you from Berkeley, California, unceded Olone land for one more day. We move tomorrow, so wish me luck. And I'm going to be reading from my novel. It's page 76, if you have it and are visual like me. Um, this is fiction, right? But uh, it's a section where this character who's in Thailand finds a letter from between his parents and they're describing life in the United States. So I wanted to reverse what's usually happened, which is that Thailand's described as this exotic and strange land and give you the section in which the United States is described as an exotic and strange land. Det pulls open a drawer. He's searching for glints of color. The bracelet isn't in this drawer, but he finds the blue envelope and it unfolds into a letter. Dear Kong Kwan, the situation isn't as terrible as we thought. There's one Thai restaurant here with passable food. I've become friends with the family that runs it. They bought the place when the king was born here, betting rightly that Thais would pilgrimage to Cambridge, Massachusetts. I told them I'm not a pilgrim, or if I am, I'm the studious kind, ha ha ha. Their green curry reminds me most of home. They make it thick, fishy, and fragrant. I eat it twice a week with the money you left me and can't think of a better way to spend it since it isn't enough to, make, to allow me to come back to see you. The mother of the restaurant promises to teach me to make the curry so I can cook it in the dorms. Then what will I do with the money you left? Use it to enter museums, I guess, so I have something to write about besides classrooms and the funny ways of Yankees. There are difficult things here. They value you less if you're considerate. The school of education is a place of much debate. What I've noticed is that if you push your way into a classroom, interrupt the professor and declare a loud opinion inappropriate to your birth and age, these squishy fleshed pink skins will applaud you. If you enter the classroom as the considerate person I know, they dismiss you as a weak oriental. You must never apologize nor thank too profusely. Here, they mistake deference for weakness. I've had to train my tongue to be outspoken so I can do well in the classroom. Remember this when you return to Tufts. Imagine, they think we're a quiet kingdom of docile people. Quiet is a volume, not an appraisal of intellectual ability or cultural sophistication. But my distance from the kingdom does have me noticing how private we are. This is especially true of your class, those good true ties who perform elaborate hospitalities to mask the machinations underway. These Westerners wave their emotions like a national flag. I wonder what they would make of our saying to slit the enemy's throat with a knife dipped in honey. Surely the farang would be licking the sweet off their necks, wondering what was sticky, right up to the moment when their heads topple off. I don't know what to do with these musings and the attraction and repulsion that this strange and sincere, passionate country brings out in me. I worry that I'm warping into something else, that this change will not improve my character like in those English novels, but set me apart from our countrymen. I was counting on you changing with me. At least we'd be transformed together. So please come back. Our two paths have barely converged. How agonizing to be separated so soon. I'm almost out of space and haven't asked. How is your father? Will he linger? I don't wish to speed his decline, but it's unbelievable that he fell ill just after you arrived. I still fume that your brothers weren't called home and that you don't feel a corresponding anger that you were. You're the youngest, I know, you're the daughter. So my darling, are you fulfilled by this duty? Does it please you to tend to the patriarch? Because I wish you were here and not only so we can be together. You deserve to study abroad. Our scheme so unlikely when we conceived it has more merit than just bringing us together. You haven't stayed long enough to grow addicted to the freedoms here. You can say what you want, 
without consequence. You can disagree without insulting a person. In short, you can think for yourself. They even welcome it. I want you to return to America so you will get the chance to grow into the person you were meant to be. Remember, we'll be mutants together, a mix of both countries, picking and rejecting qualities as we please. If your father passes soon, come straight back. And if he doesn't, negotiate your release. Don't let them keep you in the kingdom, fettered by obligation. With all my love, Udom. Thank you so much, Sinisa. Um, I'm going to bring Thiri back on screen. Um, and thank you again for these beautiful readings. Um, again, there are links to purchase Thiri and Sinisa's books in the chat. We have an excerpt of Names for Light up on the margins right now as well. So please do um, read it and then get the book and, and read the whole thing. Um, I would love to start our conversation um, with a question about names and about ancestry, kind of drawing from the title of your book theory. Um, and kind of as an entry point, I would love to ask you each if you could share a little bit about the story behind your name, kind of what stories can we read and what your parents named you, um, whatever you feel comfortable sharing in the space. Um, and please do jump in, whoever would like to go first. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Um, Sunith, I'm so glad you chose to read that letter. Um, and I loved your reasons for choosing that. I also wanted to say, I forgot to mention, um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am in Amherst, Massachusetts, and I stand on Dunatuck land. Um, so it's funny because when I was in school, that was often an assignment that we had to ask our parents what our name meant and why they named us that. And I felt like my parents, my mom was the first person to show up um, in the attendee list. So she's here. Um, and so maybe she can, you know, correct me if I'm, if I'm recalling this incorrectly, but I felt like every time I asked my parents, they had a different answer <laughs> um, for what it meant. And then also for why I was named that. Um, so for a while I was told that theory meant glory or gold and then at some point I heard dignity and I really hung on to that um, because I really liked that more than glory. Um, and I think my mom said that like part of the reason they named me theory was because my parents were planning to go to Bangkok or to move to Thailand around the time I was born. But it, I don't know if this even makes sense because I feel like I was born well before they made the move, like a year before the move happened. Um, and yet she says like, well, yeah, theory, because it's the same as Siri, um, which is which is the name of the queen and the princess at the time. Um, so that was sort of one story that I was told. Um, and again, my mom's here, so maybe she can clear things up in the chat. Let us know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll jump in. I love this question. I've been obsessed with names, you know, for a long time and wrote an essay about it. So I have a whole arc. Um, my mom and dad, my mom also here. Hi, mom. Um, my mom and dad, my dad's white American, my mom's Thai. They had a deal where if they had daughters, <laughs> um, Thai names, but American nicknames, as you can see in the chat. And my brothers are Michael, William, and Daniel. So, um, and they were trying to do this cult, you know, kind of hybrid cultural thing because I'm mixed race. But Thai people don't name uh, their children after ancestors. And I'm named from my mother's mother, which I love. But my grandmother, Ama, is always like, oh, these crazy foreigners. Like she has to also then explain the strange customs <laughs> um, because what are the chances that there are two Sunisas in one household? Uh, I was told growing up, I think pretty uniformly, although mom, you know, correct me, <laughs> that my name meant beloved daughter-in-law, which I kind of hated because, oh. It's just such a dutiful meaning. Uh, but I was really kind of digging into that and writing an essay about it. And I had my mom check the name meaning. And it turns out um, the way you write Sunisa, if you're like Thai and super well educated, means beloved daughter in law. But my um, grandparents, because this is my grandmother's name, are immigrants from China. And so they just sounded out Sunisa. So it's written in the more phonetic, simple way, which actually means beautiful night. And so that is what my name means, spelled the way it's spelled in Thai. 
I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I am so thrilled that your relatives and your, your mothers are here. Um, so welcome to them too. Um, I want to ask another question about names um, and sort of about the, the stories you're telling in your books you know, the places you're writing about have had many names, the original names, the reclaimed names, the colonial names, the anglicized names. And I'd love to hear from each of you your thoughts on kind of what changes in a place and in a, and in a people when the names of the places they have lived for, you know, generations and generations um, are changed. And again, Sunisa, would you start us off? And just sure. Um, the Myanmar and Burma is such an interesting uh, history of this that I'm excited to hear about. Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking about Thailand, which we like to say was never colonized, which it wasn't formally. Thailand used to be Siam. And after 1932, when, you know, the people you would say like seized um, the government and overthrew the absolute monarchy, it changed to Thailand, which means land of the free. At the same time, that is also a hegemonic move because it, it nods towards the Thai people, T-A-I, but the country is not made up of only the Thai people. And so I guess that's, for me, a good illustration of how problematic um, these sort of idealistic moments in history can be. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, in a small way, that's what that means. It, <laughs> to speak about English and Thai, I've always hated I mean, I grew up in English calling the city of my origin Bangkok. And then sometimes these like white men would like give me significant looks when I said the name of the city. And it was like so sketchy and, you know, kind of naively, I didn't understand that for a very long time. But in Thai, Bangkok is called Brung Thae, which means city of angels. And so I think one thing that happens when you speak a lot of languages is you're not even looking for the lascivious connotations of something like you don't, because it's just, what you grew up in, you know, you're just kind of, um, I always thought, oh, City of Angels, and it was such a pity that in English, that's not what people hear right away. So. Mm, that's so interesting. Oh, so I, said, I just relate to what you said so much. I remember um, also because I lived in Bangkok, and I didn't even know the Thai name for it because I didn't speak Thai in my family. Um, my mother spoke it the best and my father spoke it some, but the kids, we were homeschooled and we didn't speak it. So I can definitely relate to that feeling of like being in, I don't know, high school, middle school and me saying Bangkok and all the boys giggling and I didn't know why. <laughs> um, but I think this, the one time that that really bothered me was when there was a cyclone. And I think my English teacher was talking about how Phuket was really devastated by it. And I was very sad to learn that because my parents had won this like cruise to Phuket when I was young and we never went on like family vacations. And so this was a huge deal. And um, I just remembered, I was so excited for them. They had beautiful pictures of it. So even though I'd never been there, I had this like connection to the place and it was devastating to hear about the cyclone. And my classmates could only hear the word Phuket and, and laugh about it. And that was, yeah, that was very othering and upsetting. But I also wanted to return to the first question too, because I related to what you were talking about with having to explain um, your name even to other Thai people, because my name Theory is actually a name that my mom made up. I forgot to mention this. I guess that's important. Um, but the, uh, the common Burmese name is Thiri with a shortened vowel at the end and one I. Um, and so when I have to, when I meet English speakers, I have to repeat my name many times. But even when I meet Burmese speakers, I also have to repeat my name many times because they're like, what, Thiri? Like, I've never heard that. Um, and till this day, like, there are certain Burmese speaking people in my life who call me Thiri. Um, and I don't think they even know that that's not my name. And it's gotten to a point where I just don't correct them anymore. Um, but anyway, to answer the actual question that you asked, Lily, I think probably one of the most common questions I ever get on the topic of um, being a Burmese person is like, is it Burma or Myanmar? And can you explain why there's two names? So that's just something that I've always had to answer. Um, and people often ask me that 
because they want to do the right thing. They want to call the country by the right name. Um, and it's difficult to give a clear cut answer because Burma, which is the word, the, the name that was used um, in most of Western countries in the United States for a really, really long time, up until around 2013, um, was, you know, a, a name given to the country by colonizers, um, or the anglicized version is a, it's a, it's a name given by the British colonizers. Um, but the reason why Western countries refused to call the country Myanmar for so long was because of the dictatorship. Um, and so for me, it always felt like this weird choice between choosing to acknowledge the dictatorship or choosing to acknowledge the history of colonialism and both were equally bad. Um, and in, and I'll go into this later, my Burmese is like very rudimentary. I have a first grade education, but from my understanding of it um, in Burmese, like Myanmar and Burma are basically synonyms. They mean the same thing anyway. So it's really just this like, um, fight that exists in the English language. I, I actually want to skip ahead a little bit in my questions and, and talk about language because I think you're both getting at this really complicated, multi-layered um, idea of, of writing in English. Both of your books are in English, but you know, really kind of geared towards Asian audiences. Um, and so I, I want to hear, I'd love to talk to both of you and hear you talk about writing in English instead of in Thai or in Burmese. And um, Yuri, I love there are points in your book where you kind of dissect the English words that you're using, you translate them into Burmese, you talk about just like the nuance, the like places we are kind of um, missing being able to go because we are reading in English and you are writing in English. So. I would love to hear you talk about that. I'd love, um, I'm curious sort of like, where was the line that you got to where you felt like you needed to cross it or you couldn't cross it in English, you had to cross it in Burmese. And I'd love, I mean, Sumi said to hear you as well, you're writing about Thailand for a Southeast Asian audience. I'd love to hear what it um, was like to tell the story in a good true Thai in English. Whoever, whoever wants to start. I guess I can go um, since we're taking turns starting, it seems. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just want to go off on my last comment about how my Burmese is very rudimentary, but it's more than that. It's also very idiosyncratic and um, frankly, like anachronistic, you know, because I learned it from my parents who left the country in 1990. And um, so it's like 1990 Burmese. I'm sure that contemporary Burmese is quite different now. Um, but when I was writing names for light, um, I actually refused to look up Burmese words in like a English or Burmese dictionary or to do, um, to really improve <laughs> my language skills because what I wanted to capture was not like a true dictionary meaning of these words, um, but more my understanding of them, my emotional understanding of them because I wasn't trying to create, um, you know, a text that was going to be authoritative on um, the language, the experience, the country, anything like that. I was just trying to um, kind of have the reader follow along with my process of discovery and recovery and um, writing um, and doing research, which was just interviewing my parents basically and thinking about what words meant to me. Um, I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but yeah, to get to what you asked about, like where, where that line was, where I felt I had to lean on the Burmese, I don't know if I could even really pinpoint those moments for you or for myself, because I think growing up bilingual, so having um, both Burmese and English as my native languages, and then losing Burmese when we moved to the States, um, I, yeah, I, I feel like I always had um, this like Burmglish that, is, that was in my head and that I used to like make sense of the world. Um, and I think that for me, like there isn't this clear cut division between languages. Um, I write in English because that's the only language that I'm fluent in and that I can actually write in. But 
it doesn't mean that that's the only language that I think in or that impacts my thinking or impacts my lived experience. And so what I was trying to do in the book was to have English sort of like to, to change the English so that it served that reality inside of my brain. Mm. I love that. And I really think that is something that you accomplish in the book itself too. I really could feel that. Um, Sumisa. Siri, I love your answer when you said um, the part where you said that you didn't want your text to be authoritative. And I thought that was really speaking beautifully to some of the things that creative writing can do. You know, once you relinquish this idea of a scholarly text or an academic text in that way, like in, in some ways it can be so much more moving. Um, yeah, we have a lot of similarities there. I definitely could not have written a novel in Thai. <laughs> and I learned Thai from my mom. Um, I did grow up in Thailand, so I, you know, got like my spoken Thai is updated until I left, um, which was when I was 18, so a while ago. Um, <laughs> But I, I wrote the book in English. This has a lot of layers for me. Um, first, sometimes particularly in dialogue, I was actually hearing the book in Thai. And I then, you know, this is not what you learn in an MFA in America, but I was trying to make some choices about how to mimic the banter. That's really hard because um, while I would try to capture the cadences of something humor, is often very language specific. And so in Thai, there's gonna be a lot of punning and puns. And in English, that comes across as a bad dad joke in this very dated way that like, why would these 18 year old boys be making puns? You know, in English that jangles. But I had some things to decide. Like I tried to stay away from slang in American English and in British English, but that made slang really difficult. <laughs> and I think, there could be kind of a formal feeling to the book because I was trying to efface the English and find a workable English for actually another language. Um, I think my novel makes a lot of sense when you think of it as translated. And, you know, some of the stuff that I love where you're like, oh, in dialogue, you know, develop your ear, that doesn't really work when you're working out of another language. Um, I, I wrote about this period of the 1970s um, about a revolution that is very politically uh, sensitive in Thailand. So actually writing in English allowed me to be more explicit about what happened, allowed me to be more safe. And I, I wanted people to read the book who weren't Thai also to know that like Thailand is actively suppressing this history and suppressing its democracy protesters. So there's a part of my book that is activism, in fact, because it's in English as well. Um, but I, you know, I've really come to think about that a lot because then my novel hasn't been published in the US where I think it felt a little too translated. I deliberately didn't center um, Americans. And so I was like, oh, does a refusal to translate the book in some ways mean that it shouldn't be read in the West? You know, I, I had hoped I wouldn't have to make those decisions about audience and, and haven't because luckily the book is a bestseller in Asia. Um, but yeah, those are some of the things that come up for me. So interesting. Um, I'd actually love to go from there, from this conversation to talking and hearing a little bit about kind of how you put your books together, about the structure of the work itself. And um, in theory, to start off with Names for Light, I was so interested in this kind of non-linear, in my mind, kind of cyclical narrative where it was like, as you read, you're sort of unraveling the story. Um, I'd love to hear your, like, why that, that sort of structure appealed to you. I also, on a very practical level, I'm really interested in like, um, the white space on each page. So if you don't have the book, um, there are many pages kind of space the the work out like this and um it really to me kind of resonated like poetry and I'm just so curious what the decision was behind placement of each kind of block of text um and again about structure I wish I had um like a clear answer for you <laughs> um and I wish that it was a very you know like premeditated decision but I think the truth is that um, for a really long time, for most of my writing life, I didn't want to write nonfiction. I didn't want to write about my family or about my family stories. 
And then um, I tried it. And once I started, it just kind of poured out. And a lot of the stories um, disappear in the book in the order in which they came to me, that they came out of me. Um, and I think that the way they came out was that I would like sit down and write just, um, I had I had the great grandfather as the beginning point because that was sort of the origin point of like my sense of self um, have you know in terms of temporality, but after that um, everything was just through associative logic. I would just write down a memory or a story, and it would spur this other memory or story, and it would just kind of unravel for me, maybe in the same way that it unraveled for the reader. Um, I know that sounds too neat or too magical. Um, but of course there's an editing process that happens. Of course, I agonized over, you know, um, where the blocks would go and exactly what the white space would look like. But for the most part, I was writing these in a fragmentary fashion as they came to me and sort of just allowing myself to trust my intuition and how um, I arranged them. The part that was more premeditated was probably like the personal narrative story, um, the personal narrative thread. At the time I started this book, I had lived in five different places over the course of five years. And so I was just really interested in, in, in each place because I was there for such a short period of time. Um, I found that I was really impacted by the feeling of being in that place, um, the newness of that place. And the newness never really wore off, right? Because I was only there for one or two years um, at the most before I left. And so it made sense to me to have those places be the grounding um, the grounding for my personal narrative. And then once that was in place, I thought, well, then maybe I should ground the other fragments in places too, um, in places where my ancestors had lived. So that's where the chapter titles came in. Mm. This is leading me actually to my next question, which is about genre and how you as writers decide which genre you want to work in. Um, theory I have in your acknowledgments, I forget who exactly you were thinking, but there was some note about just like, what is nonfiction anyway? Um, which really made me laugh because I mean, this book won a nonfiction prize. It is nonfiction, but it did again, kind of read to me almost like a book of poetry. Um, so I'd love to just hear you both talk about like genre. What is genre anyway is sort of my overarching question here. I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of the really, the blurriness between each genre and how you decided, um, you know, Sunisa, how you decided that fiction was the medium that you wanted to tell your story in, in a novel. Um, in theory, I mean, again, your thoughts, like what is nonfiction, what is genre? I'll take it. Um, you know, I think you, my, my way of moving through this is that I use the genre that serves um, the purpose the pur purpose of the writing. So I write essays and I enjoy them a lot. And I enjoy being able to just think and say and like have my mind. It feels kind of like intellectual firepower. Where you're just like, let's just go and discuss this thing and keep discussing it. Um, but in the case of A Good True Thai, uh, I really wanted to have people feel what it was like to be in this period of 1973 to 1976. And that um, because it concerns a youth uprising and then a massacre, I thought that telling would really bounce people out and that when you're dealing with large scale trauma like that, there can be a hardening around, you know, people's ability to take in what that really means. Um, and so for that, I love fiction and the way it can put you into people's bodies and you can go really slow and get attached and see what happens to everyone as they journey through this radicalization. Um, I also think that fiction can be very truthful, you know, that sometimes we worry that it's not, but in fact, you know, it's very honest because it says that this comes through the consciousness of the writer. And I find that is a label that has a lot of honor to it. Um, as an undergraduate, I played around with journalism a little bit, and it, it got me looking at the way that Western journalists would cover Thailand. And I felt honestly that it was very dishonest that they said that something was happening that was truthful that was in fact inaccurate. If you were a local, you could see that. Um, but they had the authority. And then because it was nonfiction or journalism in this case, there was an imprimatur of truth. 
Uh, so, so I also just like that for me, I think fiction has some humility built into it that I think is really important. What's that? Thank you. I love that too. I love that line. I wrote it down. Fiction can be very truthful. My first book was fiction. And like I said, I didn't think I'd ever write nonfiction. I was writing short stories and I wanted to write novels. I still want to write novels. <laughs> um, although I feel like I've forgotten how. Um, but anyway, this is not the time or place for that. Um, but I, at first I wanna say that I'm really grateful to Grey Wolf because um, I think they're really interested in expanding what nonfiction is or can be. Um, and that's so exciting for me. Um, but anyway, for me, I've said this many times, every time I'm asked this question of like, what's the difference between fiction and nonfiction? I've always said like, I don't really know what the difference is. And it's definitely cost me like jobs. Um, I've interviewed for nonfiction jobs and said that and have never received, uh, you know, like a call back after I say that. Because I think people really do want to know um, and they want to create boundaries and understand genres and make sense of them. But when I say that there isn't a difference for me, I think what I really mean is just that even when I was writing fiction, um, I was still drawing heavily from my life and my experience, maybe not in a factual sense, but always in an emotional sense. I was always drawing from the emotional truth. Um, and I think that the reason I didn't want to write nonfiction for so long and didn't write it for so long was because I kind of had um, a false idea that um, the emotional and factual truth um, were, could, you know, um, were at odds with each other. I felt like having to adhere to a factual truth in nonfiction was going to limit me um, and make it harder for me to express the emotional truths that I wanted to express. And so when I started writing Names for Light, um, I basically challenged myself to take on the book as if it were a work of fiction, meaning to, to try to be true to the emotional truth of my experiences without compromising um, the quote unquote facts. And for me, that was more about like my responsibility to other people, right? Um, I, I had, I had to acknowledge the fact that if I was going to change details or embellish things or imagine things, it wasn't just impacting my story, but the stories of the other people who were involved, who I was telling, um, the stories of the other people whose stories I was telling, like my family, but also just like Burmese people in general. Um, so yeah, that was that was sort of like my big breakthrough um, with nonfiction is that it can be whatever you want to be also, you know? Um, and I don't think that, yeah, I don't think there has to be the strict divide. One essay that's really exciting um, and that has helped me think through this a lot is Jenny Bully's EEO genre sheet. I highly recommend it. I can put it in the chat. That would be amazing. Um, I actually, in my next questions, want to kind of dig a little bit deeper into this idea that you're bringing up theory of um, emotional verse or and factional factual truth um and i'm curious in hearing kind of how you both research for these books um you know memory history it's all sort of fallible depending on on who is telling it you know what that experience was colored by and i'd love to hear just a little bit about like how did you gather the stories um, that became Names for Light and A Good True Tie, but also, um, and Cindy, so this question is sort of specifically to you, but I'm interested in hearing kind of like the accountability you felt to the story you were telling, particularly with historical fiction, um, you know, that as you were saying is being suppressed um, in Thailand. Do you want to start us off, Cindy? Sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, great difficulty. This took me years <laughs> and um, I don't actually recommend it as a first novel attempt because it added this layer that was so hard. I spent a lot of time broadly in the archive. Um, I live near UC Berkeley right now and uh, they have a really great collection of Southeast Asian material that after some trouble I got access to. Um, and you know, there's a tension there because the period I was researching 
is censored in Thailand, I actually needed to access the archive in the United States in order to read what had happened. There's testimony from survivors and a lot of them went on to do their PhDs at Cornell, but left their dissertations unpublished um, because of the political danger. However, you can get that dissertation pulled if you're in the United States and still read it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there I was like a studious little mouse and that was very fun too. Um, and then I interviewed uh, survivors of an old activist, survivors of the period. Um, that's where being bilingual came in a lot of handy, not just because I could interview them myself without a translator, but there's a cultural fluency that's needed in order to get people to talk to you um, and trust you with these memories that the state has wiped out. And I, you know, wanted my book, it's not, it's quite a long book. Um, and I wanted to assure these activists that I wasn't just gonna give this simple gloss, you know, this one paragraph sensationalist something, and that I would give them and their stories the time that it deserved in narrative uh, to, to really honor what they had gone through. Um, so those are some of the main avenues of research. I love to build things out of interview in the archive. I actually think it's really fun. Um, but, and then also at the end, I have an author's note because there's really not a lot about Thailand <laughs> that's out there and this is fiction. So anywhere that I deviated from the historical record, which I really tried not to, but sometimes um, felt I had to for accessibility, <laughs> uh, I wrote that in the back so that people don't mistake what I wrote actually for history, you know. Um, thank you. I really admire your project, Anita. It's so impressive. Um, I, I just, yeah, I'm just blown away by how much research you must have done, how much research you obviously did in the book. Um, I, I feel like I could not write a book like that. <laughs> I don't, yeah, it's just not in my skill set. I, I, I have so much like admiration and respect for people who do that. And I'm so glad that um, you wrote this book, which is amazing. And I definitely wanna, I actually teach this class on post-dictatorial literature. And I think it'd be perfect for that class. But for me personally, with this project, um, it, was, it was not really like a research archival project for me. Um, it was more like a internal project, I guess. Um, where, like I said, like I didn't even look up, you know, the de dictionary definitions of Burmese words. So I also um, kind of just relied on my parents as um, primary sources, so like the archive of their bodies was my main archive. And the book is very, uh, how do I say this, like metafictional, not in a sort of, not in an annoying way. <laughs> or what I mean, it's not in the sense of like, I have male anxiety about narrative, but more in the sense of like, um, I am writing about the process of writing and researching. <laughs> Thanks, Anissa. I'm writing about the process of writing and researching um, more than what is being researched. So that was built into the structure of the book and the style of the book, which I hope um, was enough to kind of offset the lack of like, um, academic research that I did because I wasn't trying to again like write um, a historical fiction novel or like you know an authoritative text from Myanmar I was just trying to write um, about my own understanding of myself and my family and allow for that to have um, whatever mistakes or inaccuracies that it had with the acknowledgement that like that was built into the structure. Mm. Interesting. Um, I have a couple of more questions for Sinisa and Theory, but to our audience members, we do want to do audience Q&A in just a moment. So if you have questions, please drop them into the Q&A box. Um, we have a couple of great ones already. I'm very excited to engage with those. Um, one question I want to ask you both before we um, kind of shift over to Q&A is um, I'd love to ask for your thoughts and reflections on 
um, this quote from Names for Light that I really loved. I feel like I, I marked up half of the book as I was reading it. And Sunny said, I read a digital copy of your book, which was doing the same kind of highlighting on my computer. Um, the quote is, whiteness is not a color or a race or an ethnicity, but a construct of power, the power to speak, to tell stories, not only about oneself, but about other people. Um, and I would love to kind of pause here. This is actually sort of one of the first audience questions we have. Um, you know, we are celebrating your books at the Asian American Writers Workshop on our virtual stage. I'd love to hear who you see your books as being in conversation with. What were the books you turned to as guides while you were writing? Um, I want to invite you here to call, you know, friends into this space. Are there are there essays that you read? Are there writers that you admire? Um, who you see your work kind of speaking to? Can I just talk about that quote, though, from Theory's book? I loved it so much. I was like, oh, thank God she said it. And um, yeah, that just had, you know, I found so much of the book powerful and helpful because um, you can kind of point to this book and be like, this is what it's like. And I'm so glad, Theory, that you let go of some of the, you know, need to think about accuracy or like these sort of small categories in the end because it allowed the book to get much bigger and to mean more. Um, can I just read another quote from your book that I thought really pairs well with uh, the one that Lily just read? It's 182. I have emerged so I can be put on display proudly as a token of civilization and progress. Look how much better off I am. You know, that just like killed me too. I was like, oh, way to name that experience. Yeah. I also have that marked with red ink in my copy. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Sunis. I love that quote in pairing too. I, and I'd love to hear, are there books that were your guide? I'm taking that idea of like a guide during the writing, writing process from Gina's question um, in our audience. That books your book is in conversation with, books that served as guides as you were writing them? Yeah, um, I'm going to go quickly through it because there are a lot, but the, the you know, I've talked a little bit about it. I stole the structure of my book from War and Peace because um, I'm so, you know, defiantly out of fashion, but I found that to be a very useful book for me and Tolstoy, a useful writer because um, it has the breadth of life and it is a book that really talks about how you should be and what you should grow into which my novel is very concerned about because these young protagonists are coming of age and they're thinking about where they live, what that will mean for them, and in Debt's case, what to do with the privilege. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from Toni Morrison um, when I didn't put any white characters in my novel. You know, I presumed to center Thai people. Um, I presumed to think that our stories are interesting enough. Maybe I presumed too much because it wasn't published in the States, but there we are. Um, you know, I thought a lot about <laughs> this, this might only make sense to me, but Adrienne Rich is a poet, um, an extremely powerful poet. And she has this poem diving into the wreck. And to me, the poem really talks about the journey of the soul that you go through when you go through a political awakening, which I did writing this novel. And so I really felt like her work also kept me company um, in what felt often like a very lonely thing I was doing because when I was writing the novel, uh, the majority you know, of Thai people thought <laughs> I was totally bonkers for coming to the conclusions that I was coming to. So, yeah. Interesting. I'm gonna embarrass some of the audience members by calling out their books <laughs> as examples of books that um, were my guides or yeah, I don't know if guide's the right word, but like my inspiration to continue writing. Um, Mary Kim Arnold's Litany for the Long Moment, Ella Long Praise, How to Keep You Alive. Um, Jim and Hans, The Small Revolution. Thank you so much to all of you for coming. But also Lily Wong's The Bestiary, um, Janice Lee and her nonfiction. Um, Michael Andache's Running of the Family. Jenny Gooley's Betwixt and Between, which I've already mentioned earlier. It's a collection of essays, but I think I was just so excited to see all these Asian American writers um, creating works of like hybrid nonfiction. Um, 
that looked very different from what I thought nonfiction had to look like. And that, I don't know, that sort of just gave me permission to do my own thing as well, um, to feel like I wasn't alone in it. Thank you both for these recommendations. Um, I want to ask, there is a wonderful question from our audience member, Sabrina Lin, um, which says, Theory, I was really struck by the parallels between the passage you read aloud, um, and the quote is, the end of yawn of peril, enmity, strife, and the title of your first book, the end of peril, the end of enmity, the end of strife, a haven. Do you see both of these works and maybe even future works as part of a larger series, trilogy, et cetera? Or was this a more coincidental or natural connection given that both works are rooted in your experiences? And they say, hi, Professor. <laughs> hi, Sabrina. I hope you're doing well. Um, I forgot to email the rest of our Asian American Lit course, but I will for my next event. Thank you so much for coming. It's so good to hear from you. Um, I, oh, there's another question in the chat and I just answered Gina's question. Um, I don't know if y'all can see that, but I've listed the questions there. I can put it in the chat as well. I mean, I listed the books that I mentioned. Oh, yeah, there we go, thank you. Um, so Sabrina, I feel like The End of Peril was my fictional attempt at um, dealing with some of the themes that are in Names for Light. And the Names for Light was my like, okay, I give up, I'll just take it on head on in nonfiction. So I don't know if there's like a third book that's going to, that I'm gonna need to unpack these themes of like displacement, migration, belonging, um, et cetera. Maybe I'll write like a book of poetry next, you know, that's gonna be about the same, the same themes, like who knows? Um, maybe I can actually move on and write about something else. But yeah, I think that for me, it's really interesting because like, the two books on the surface seem really different. Um, End of Peril, when I try to describe the plot of it, it sounds basically like a science fiction novel because um, the plot is that there is a domed utopian city that's climate controlled with um, genetically modified trees that grow feral and break out of the dome and spread over the earth. And the narrator is escaping this dome city and returning to an environmentally devastated light post-colonial city where she was born. Um, so that's the like narrative arc of the end of peril. Um, and it sounds very magical realist or science fiction or slipstream or whatever you call it. But for me, like when I wrote that book, I was writing through the same emotional truths that are in Names for Light. So the truth, the emotional truths of like being othered in the place that you call home, um, you know, like, migration, not just of the narrator, but also of her ancestors, sort of the temporal, um, the, the, I don't know how to put this, but sort of the ways in which colonialism is not something that only exists in the past, but is an ongoing present and even actually kind of like an apocalyptic future. So the same themes are coming up for me um, in both books. And I think that's kind of why you're seeing those connections there. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sabrina, for that wonderful question. Um, we are almost at the end of our time together. I have one more question that I want to ask and then um, kind of a final wrap up question. Um, so I wanted to kind of end with my questions, at least. I wanted to end with a question about ghosts and curses and hauntings. Um, I loved in your book theory, there's a lot about um, curses, haunted rooms, haunted homes that you and your family have occupied. And um, an idea that I'm really intrigued by is this idea of people bringing their gods with them when they immigrate to another place and um, or are displaced to another place. And I'd love to hear both of your thoughts. Um, you know, when your families came to this country or when you came to this country or left the countries that you were born in, did you and your family bring your gods? Did you bring ghosts? Did you bring both? Did you bring none? Um, this is a little bit more of like a magical realist question as, as you're talking about theory, but I was so interested in this strain in your book. I love this question, Lily, because for me, it's not so much that we brought um, our people, or not our people, but our spirits, but that they were already here. 
um, the sort of like Burmese animist Buddhist upbringing worldview that I had was um, had already accounted for like the whole world and universe. <laughs> and so when when um, we moved to America, it was like, okay, we left the, I, and mommy, I'm sorry if I am like butchering this, but I forget exactly what, there's like four quadrants. It's like in the North, um, there are these special spirits that govern in the South, there are these spirits and in the East and West there are these spirits. And so, yeah, it was interesting because I, it wasn't like we're bringing them. They were like already here. And sometimes I almost felt like I, I'm in touch with this. I see that these spirits are here or that these governing um, celestial beings are here. And it's almost like maybe the people who were here before were not paying attention and not in touch with the spirits that were already here. I especially felt that I think when I was living in Denver um, because there's also a special, there's also like mountain spirits, for example. Um, and I, yeah, for me, I was like, okay, like the mountains are really sacred. It's not about conquering them. Like I have to have a sort of like healthy, beautiful respect for them. And I felt like so many people who lived in that city were just like, the mountains are purely recreational and we will go and conquer them every weekend. Um, and I just had a completely different attitude. So for me, it's not so much that we brought our spirits, but that they were already here. And I just kind of was like, welcomed by them in a way that I wasn't always by the people who had been here. Love that. Wow, I really agree. I think that's so beautifully said, Terry. Um, there's a lot of similarities between Thai Buddhist animism and Burmese I'm hearing right now. I think, you know, maybe people in the audience can relate. I went through this sort of arc where I very intellectually studied Buddhism and was like, all these things from my, that I was taught growing up, you know, are not Buddhist and in fact are animus and superstitious. And I sort of condemned it as such, but now um, I've come around to really loving um, the upbringing I had, which, and I got to put this in my novel, um, which I see as a sign of strength that like recognizes the trees and the water and the ground. And it's like, there are spirits in this. And, you know, when, um, like we were looking at homes, part of the practice is to actually respectfully be like, could I live here? Would you like me to? And not presume that it is entirely my capitalist choice, you know, but that there is a mutual feeling that can be, um, that can come between like the land and the people. And I have also found a lot of solace in that and refuge, you know, in ways um, that have been very comforting because it isn't always easy to look the way I look in this country. So yeah, I've, I've really um, been thankful for that. And I wanted to say in Thai, you don't bring a Buddha somewhere, you rent the Buddha, right? Chow, not Su or Ao, uh, because it's not yours in the first place. So I really love this idea that you also only borrow and ask permission from uh, your spirits if they want to come and protect you. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you both. Um, we are again almost at the end of our time, but the very last thing I wanted to ask and, you know, not to put either of you on the spot, but I wanted to see if there are any questions either of you had for each other. I know I have sort of taken up our hour asking you both questions um, and no pressure, but if there are any questions, any curiosities you have about each other's work, I wanted to give you a moment here at the end of our, our time. Sunita, I would love to hear what you're working on now or is what you've been working on since you finished this gigantic, impressive, huge novel. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I mean, you know, the humility really sunk in. And so I, I was like, one point of view, no research, contemporary. <laughs> so I'm working on a novel. I wrote it in the early days of the pandemic and now um, I'm revising it but I'm trying for something that isn't so, I think a friend described my first novel as the steepest way up the mountain. <laughs> and so I'm trying not to do that, mm -hmm. um, but moving soon. And so who knows how much writing I'll get done. Theory, this isn't a craft question, but I just really wanted to say, you know, how's it going? Are you enjoying this beautiful book and has it really sunk in? Um, 
I'm so glad that it's out and that people have read it and like I haven't been struck by lightning yet, right? Um, that's kind of how I felt before it was released. I was just so anxious and like, I think my sister-in-law calls it a vulnerability hangover, which I love because that's exactly what it was. I felt like I poured so much of myself into this book and then I had a year to feel anxious about how people were gonna respond to it. Um, and, and so I'm just so happy that, yeah, I'm just so happy that there it's finding its readers, you know? Um, yeah, just hearing you and uh, you and Lily read quotes from it and say how much it resonated with you, like that just made my day and that just made everything worth it. Um, all of my anxiety for the past year worth it. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm just really happy to be able to share the space with everyone. Thank you to everybody who came. There's so many people I love and that I wish I could see and hug in person. Um, we will do that someday. Um, thank you to my mom for coming also. I don't know if she's still here. Yeah, you are. I actually want to kind of take up that train of thanks and sort of formally close our evening here. Um, we always call for sort of a virtual round of applause in the chat for our authors. So please do congratulate Thierry and Sunisa on these incredible works. Um, thank you so much to everybody who joined us online. Thank you for for hopping on Zoom for us this evening, hopping on Zoom with us this evening. Um, we are so grateful to share this space with you. And I want to thank um, our incredible ASL interpreters from Pro Bono ASL, Susan, who is on screen right now, and um, Oh, I'm so sorry, Selena, who was on screen earlier. Thank you both so much for making our event accessible. Um, I want to thank our event partners at Books Are Magic. You may need to scroll up through the um, clapping emojis in the chat, but my colleague posted uh, links to purchase Denise's book, Theory's book. Um, again, there's an excerpt from Theory's book on the margins right now that you can read. Um, and finally, our event was recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, if you want to send to friends, family, colleagues, students, mentors, etc., cetera, um, it will be available again soon. Um, Thank you all again for such a beautiful evening. Thank you, Theory, for this beautiful book. And thank you, Sunisa, for the work you do. I'm so excited to read your forthcoming novel. Um, we're going to leave the Zoom open for a few more minutes so people can chat in the, in the Zoom chat. We'll play a little bit more music um, and put some slides on screen. But we hope everyone takes good care, stays safe, and that we will see you again online soon. Thank you all so much.